Hello and welcome. So glad you're here. Uh, this is the Baker Nord Center for Humanities, and this is you're on Case Western's campus. Probably you already knew that part, um, but I'm actually from the Dittrich Medical History Center and Museum, and that's not in this building. Um, it's across the street. It's on a Delbert and Euclid, and it's sort of across from Severance. I like to call it Severance Light kind of looks similar, small version. And the museum is on the third floor. Jim Evanson is the curator, he's over here. And the, we have about a, more than 150,000 artifacts total, obviously not all on display, but they are um, really rare and interesting historical, medical, technological artifacts. And we encourage all of you to come back and visit us. And we are now open till seven o'clock on Wednesday nights, so we can collect some of you that have trouble getting down during the week. The rest of the time, we're open from 9 to 4.30, Monday through Friday. And my name is Brandy Skilache. So today, we're here to talk about uh, disease. And it's a good time of year for that, because we're all trying not to catch diseases right now. Um, I used to, I, I'm not teaching this semester, but always uh, the January, I would think I had so many students. And then come February, I realized I had more. I was like, oh, where have you been? <laughs> so. In some ways, I think we're all really familiar with illness and not wanting to, you know, to catch something that's going to make us ill and make us unhappy. But a bigger problem is diseases, epidemics. We worry about what comes next. And I think it's a really present moment right now because we've had the Ebola scare, there have been measles outbreaks. A lot of things are sort of coming back around that, that have long histories that really do frighten people. And today, I want to talk a little bit about Cleveland, but also beyond Cleveland, what I call edge of disaster. And this is about vaccines and epidemics in history. So the structure of conversations, you're all taking part in conversations, which means you get to talk too, which is great. I'll be giving a 15-minute presentation, followed by a short mini panel where I'm going to talk to some guests. And I'm going to let them introduce themselves here in a little bit. And following that, we're going to break into small groups and do some roundtables where you will get to actually look at and answer some questions about how you feel about epidemics and disease and vaccines and medicine and a lot of other things. And then we'll take it back to a larger group and finish up. So it should be a very engaged uh, conversation, a time when we can all get together and talk about really important issues. And we do have, we will have more of these throughout the course of the year. And I can talk a little bit about that as we go. So. Oh, sorry, one other thing. Um, we are supported in part by the Cleveland Medical Library Association and also by the Inamori Center for Ethics and, um, and Excellence here on campus. And so they've been a big part of making this happen. And I just wanted to recognize them. And the Dittrich Medical History Center is part of the College of Arts and Sciences. So outbreak. In my role, I, I do look a lot at history, but I'm also the managing editor of an anthropology journal, a medical anthropology journal. And that means I read a lot about conditions in other countries. And I think, in general, we have a tendency to think that disease and epidemic is something that happens over there, some other place. So it was really frightening to people when the Ebola outbreak seemed like it was going to come back and return in some way to the US. So it happened in parts of Africa. There were live tweets of this. I mean, social media actually carried this into people's homes and onto their phones in ways that I don't think normally that hasn't happened in, uh, in the past, even the recent past. So suddenly there was a scare, and people wondered what was going to happen. And it allows us to kind of see uh, private terrors, the things that really frighten people. It's so easy to say that's something that happens somewhere else. So let's take a look at this. Ebola might be a more modern uh, threat to us, but fear and mistrust and the kind of desperation that those incited have historical antecedents. So tonight, for my portion of this, I'm going to give you a little bit of history. I'm going to talk about cholera, smallpox, and polio. So really lovely things. Uh, there are pictures. So fair warning. <laughs> um, it's very hard for us to, I think, realize just how um, we're used to there being cures to things. We're not used to facing something and not knowing where it comes from and not understanding how to cure it. We, we feel that knowledge is power. And so it's, it's quite rare for us to face something and just have no idea. But in fact, there have been times in the past where they did not understand where these diseases were coming from or what to do to solve the problem. 
I'm going to start with cholera. Cholera is an interesting one because of, not just because of the way its symptoms work, but the, the way poverty and blame work together. Who got blamed for these kinds of outbreaks? And I know this is going to come as a huge surprise, but it's, it's usually marginalized groups <laughs> that get blamed. I know, how strange. That never happens anymore. <laughs> the US cholera epidemic of 1832 began with an immigrant ship. So you already have this context of immigration and fear that's, that's happening connected to this. It lands in Quebec, and cases of Asiatic cholera start to spread. The, the problem was that it spread quite quickly, and it spreads through contaminated water. I'm telling you this, but none of them knew that. Nobody knew where it was coming from at the time. So it was spreading, and it created a panic, and it aided assumptions about squalor. So places that people thought, oh, poverty, they're dirty, they're filthy, they're causing it. And you had a lot of these, um, these assumptions. Now, it is true that the problem was, was dirty water, was contaminated water, but the two things were not necessarily connected. And what you saw was an equation of filth and morality. So and you've, you've heard this, right? Someone says, oh, that's a filthy joke when they might mean an immoral joke. But there is a connection here between dirt and immorality and between poverty and immorality. And so blame is very easy to blame those other people. And to say things like, well, those of us with good, clean living and good morals won't be affected. There's a, a problem with that kind of thinking in that cholera doesn't really care. <laughs> so people were getting sick anyway, and it caused massive panic. About 100,000 people fle uh, fled New York City when it only had about, what, 250,000 people at the time. So that's half the population. You can just imagine the city just emptying out. And those kinds of things happen. Um, you can imagine those things happening during like Black Plague or something. And we don't normally think of that happening in more modern times. But this wasn't that long ago. The symptoms of cholera are really nasty. I love this image. Uh, this is from uh, one of the texts. I just got this from the Welcome Library. But you see, she's, she's lovely, isn't she? She's sort of happy. She looks very nice. And then she's zombie. She's, kind of <laughs> she's sort of pale and kind of greenish in color. And it's, it's a really devastating thing because it happened very quickly. So the symptoms were diarrhea and vomiting, dehydration, shock, seizure, kind of wasting. And this could happen really, really fast. And it's uh, just as an interesting side note, I also work a lot on the history of forensics. And we have a really great forensic archive at the museum. And uh, something that was quite similar to cholera in symptoms was arsenic poisoning. And so it's interesting that if you track in the history of cholera, and the, you end up coming across arsenic poisoning cases where people were trying to pass off an actual murder as, as a disease. So the symptoms were similar, the kind of vomiting and feeling really sick. And basically, death happened fairly quickly. We had issues like this in Cleveland as well. And one of my favorite stories, I love Horace Ackley. I love to talk about Horace Ackley was this doctor. In 1849, we had an outbreak in Sandusky of cholera. And Horace Ackley, when everyone else is fleeing, everyone else is terrified, he goes 60 miles on horses. And he, he rides right into the center of the epidemic. And he single-handedly attempts to stop it. He treats it with uh, calomel, which has got antibacterial properties. And he doesn't sleep. He doesn't eat. And he just works really hard. And he manages to stop the outbreak. And it's this really wonderful story of a doctor doctor taking risks to help his patients. Ackley had some other more colorful things in his uh, past, too, like body snatching. But for today, he's the hero of this story. Uh, <laughs> he, he helps to do this, and he, he didn't even change his own clothes during all of this. And he just was there to help people unafraid of the cholera epidemic, even though it was a deadly disease. And I partly bring that up because when the Ebola outbreak happened, one of the things you saw were doctors willing to take similar kinds of risks that were going into these areas and treating people. And even though um, there are treatments for Ebola, they're, different ones are all relatively experimental. But again, there's this sense that there might not be a cure. And the fear that drives people to blame and isolate people shows right back up in our modern context. So some of the US doctors, when they wanted to come back into the United States, 
and they were quarantined and there was a lot of people saying leave them in Africa, don't let them come back, they're going to cause a massive outbreak here in the United States. So a lot of people talked about the aid workers in the same kind of way you would hear people talk about the poor and the marginalized and the dirty in these cholera ep uh, epidemics. So the rhetoric is strangely similar historically and then again today. But um, one of the, Bruce uh, Ribner, who heads up the center at Emory, sort of countered these claims and said, well, the doctors took the first risk. We should take a risk and, and be able to treat them with the same kind of humanity. The next thing I want to talk about is smallpox. Smallpox is a very, it's a very frightening disease for people, partly because of the kind of ravages that you see. It, it has these eruptions in the skin. And there's nothing quite so uh, terrifying to people as a disease they can see. Um, sometimes I think you know the invisible infection might be frightening, but you can see the effects. It really does terrify people. So in the early years of the 20th century, Cleveland experienced a major outbreak. Between 1900 and 1902, there were about 3,500 cases, and 250 people uh, died in that in those years, with some other sporadic outbursts around that time. The Dittrich Museum is really uh, lucky to have the Homer Hartzell collection, and that helps us kind of track the disease through photographs. Here's one of them. I, when I give tours at the museum and we stop by the smallpox exhibit, I have a lot of people say, oh, it's not like chickenpox. Because I believe that we've, some of the horror that's been attached to smallpox historically, you know, we don't see it. So we tend not to realize its effects. But this is not like smallpox. These were very, very uh, large, devastating pustules, and they, they left terrible scarring. Um, I think the images that we see of children with the disease kind of really bring that home to us, that this was something, on one hand, you think, oh, well, 3,500 people contracted the disease, but they didn't all die. Only 250 people died. That's OK, right? Then you look at the horrible scarring effects and you realize people carried the effects of this disease with them their entire lives. No treatments halted the disease. A little bit like cholera, you just had to wait it out and hope that the patient made it. And this is true of diphtheria and many other diseases. Imagine being a parent and watching your child suffer through something like that. It's caused by a member of the pox virus family. Um, most of these infections were caused by contact with someone else. And the respiratory uh, tract could be an entry point. It was contagious, and it was deadly, and it was disfiguring. So about the only thing you could hope to do was inoculate. And I want to talk a little bit about that because inoculation meant a couple different things. One you could give someone a form of the disease early in the hopes that they would fight it off and therefore become immune to it. On the one side here, the very sort of devastated looking arm, that's, that's one of those cases where somebody's been inoculated. That doesn't mean vaccinated. <laughs> that means you've actually given them the disease. And they would sometimes, um, I read about uh, Edward Jenner, sometimes they would actually have these children in a, in a barn or another place away from everyone else so they would have the disease, they'd be fighting it off and they'd be quarantined from other people. Imagine the devastation, imagine the fear that you would be going through in, in a situation like that. The other possibility was to inoculate you with cowpox. And this is an interesting story. How many of you have heard of Edward Jenner before? Okay, a lot of you, all right, great, this is a good story. Um, there's a lot of uh, paintings of Edward Jenner looking very heroic and, uh, and treating his patients and, and making sure that they are safe from smallpox. Um, but there was some trial and error involved here and some ethical dilemmas. For one thing, um, he, he realized in about 1768, he realized that people who had a prior infection to cowpox, so that's cows that develop a minor, uh, more mild version of this, tended to render them immune. And you just get some sort of scratchy rash and you get over it and you'd be fine. But then you wouldn't get smallpox. So in 1796, Jenner thought, I need to test my hypothesis on my servant's son. Uh, he's an eight-year-old boy. 
So, you know, on one hand, history is full of these lessons, right? You have these maverick moves that we think, well, we're glad that happened, but what a terrible risk he took. He basically infected the eight-year-old boy, whose name was James, um, with pus from the blisters of a milkmaid named Sarah, and the cow's name was Blossom, just so you know. Um, her hide hangs on the wall of St. George's Medical School Library. I, I'm sure she'd be proud um, as a cow. <laughs> so what Jenner realized was that by inoculating this boy, he didn't get smallpox. And so that seemed like a way forward toward something that's like vaccination. Smallpox in Cleveland was pretty devastating. Again, the death toll isn't necessarily, um, it's not that you're seeing tens of thousands of people die. But you're seeing people die from this disease, and you're thinking about all the disfiguration that occurred. So what were we going to do? It really brought Cleveland to its knees. All of a sudden, all of these people have this disease. Once again, the decision was made that it must have something to do with filth. And uh, the, at the time, the city's health officer was Martin Friedrich. And he, had, uh, he, he really wanted to work hard to end this disease. He really wanted to stop it in its tracks. He had some good ideas. Uh, formaldehyde is one of them. And he decided that it was a filthy disease. I found some of his papers, he describes it as a filth disease. Again, we have that connection to poverty and dirt and disease. And he would, so he just washed down whole areas. They treated them with formaldehyde in 1901. And, or, and he said, OK, we, we're done. We did it. We're phew. And then 1902 happened. <laughs> and instead of it being less, it was just as great. In fact, it was more people were infected and more people died. And it was truly um, a real, a real wake-up call. So we had to do something. And interestingly enough, in 1901, we ended up with some of the first uh, labs, one of the best lab in town. And because of that, they were able to test new and better vaccines. Because they did have vaccines for smallpox in 1901. But there was a problem. Not all the vaccines were effective. And some of them caused really devastating effects. For instance, people got sepsis. They got infections. Chunks of flesh would fall out of their arm where they had been treated. And it would be pussy. And then sometimes it didn't stop you from getting the disease anyway. So people were afraid to get vaccinated. And Martin Friedrich had to go on a campaign, essentially with the help of the greater community, uh, Cleveland community, to convince people, look, we've worked this out. We're in the labs. We're, we're doing this methodically. We're finding a way to treat this that's going to be safe. And there's lots and lots of literature out there of people arguing back and forth about whether or not these vaccines are safe. But because of the vaccination campaign, they essentially were able to stop it. So by 1905, not only are there no deaths from it, there's no new cases either. It was a newly formed Academy of Medicine. And they reinvigorated that. So you have to figure there's, there's this wonderful campaign where it's not just doctors. You do have doctors. Doctors are there. They're in the labs. They're doing the work. But it's parents. It's media professionals. It's everyday people. They come together and they vaccinate 100,000 people, which is more than half the population at the time of Cleveland. And it really does contribute to the success that you have all the people involved. M many of them are uh, quite high ranking. So basically, how you fix this problem is a community-wide effort. And one of the things that we tend to do a lot at the district is show the stories where the community matters. And that's also what this is about, why these conversations matter. Because it's not really about us telling you the story. It's about us telling each other stories. Because the community is a really important part of how this works together. And educators, an educator isn't necessarily a teacher. Anyone can be an educator. People learn all kinds of things from their children, for instance. The third, uh, condition, the third disease I want to talk about, the third outbreak, is polio. And this is one I've been working on a lot. We have a new um, directive at the museum. We're working on a big digital project, which will be kind of like a gallery one of medical history. And one of the things that I've been doing is research on diseases and outbreaks. And how do these things come together? How do they happen? How do they affect us? How are they fixed? How do we prepare? So the polio outbreak uh, struck Cleveland as it did many other cities. And there's various symptoms. They could show up over a period of hours or a period of days. And it was the constellation of symptoms that let you, it, you one person might not have all of these. So the constellation of symptoms is partly how you can detect that it's happening. But a lot of it had to do with muscle weakness. People had various forms. They would become sort of paralyzed. And the problem was, if you get that paralysis high enough up, 
you're not going to be able to breathe. So we have over at the Dittrich Museum a small and infant size uh, Iron lung, the iron lung, which helps people breathe and it sort of uses compression to allow you to have air go in and out of your diaphragm. Otherwise, you could suffocate. So you have this disease and you need to protect them, protect your family. And one of the ways that you could do this was through vaccine. And as you can see here, there's tons and tons of people lined up. This was something I found on the internet. You have a lot of people still, even at this time, not everyone's clear that the vaccine is a good idea. But the problem is that polio leaves people um, not just, it does kill people, but more than that, it can leave them debilitated for life. Just recently, last year, was it last year, the year before, there was a story carried about someone here in Cleveland who's still using their iron lung as an adult. And these cases are around the country. It could lead to paralysis or permanent disfigurement of the limbs. So again, you have a disease where there's a lasting impression. You can see what it's doing to people. And there are these big wards in Cleveland, uh, the Toomey Pavilion, for instance, where you had people going and you had iron lungs set up there. And nurses became very active. So it's very interesting how uh, important nurses became to this in trying to use physical therapy to rehabilitate people who'd already had the disease. So you have two different things going on. You want a campaign. You want to stop people from getting the disease. But you have all these people who already have the disease. And who's going to take care of them? And one of the interesting stories that we came across, actually, is Ginny Lowry. By 1959, with uh, Cleveland was a huge success, by the way. The, the immunization protocol here was very, very successful. I think it's still one of the most uh, record-breaking. Like 80% of the population was vaccinated in a really short period of time. And it was just a, a real, um, uh, it was a representation of what you could do when everyone got involved. But what happens after the diseases stops to threaten is the really interesting part, in my opinion, of this story. It's a success story. We won, Cleveland. But in 1959, after the vaccines had stopped polio, the public stopped giving to the March of Dimes. And that meant the March of Dimes stopped paying for respiratory centers and for the health care of people who still suffered. We have something like this going on right now. Uh, the people who were affected by the first responders to 9-11 who were uh, affected by diseases of the lungs and um, the, the kind of chemicals that were in the air afterwards, they lobbied to have a fund put in place that would help take care of their medical bills. And it expired recently and wasn't renewed. And you still have people suffering from the disease. So it's, it's a similar kind of situation. When we cease to see the threat, we forget really quickly what that means. Uh, Ginny Lowry is interesting because she, she was one of the people who recognized the problem. She wrote letters. She, was, uh, she wanted to help polio survivors. She alerted survivors in every state to write their congressmen. And through this networking, she was able to do really powerful things. The 1959 uh, campaign for, the, for national, <coughs> excuse me, national attendant care demonstrated and solidified her belief that networking, the power of connecting people to do good, was essential to getting things done. And there's a quote here. She says, networking links people who share common needs and common goals. Networking is a support system. It's a method of self-organizing. It is a structure of social movement. Most of all, it is a method by which people get things done. I like her story a lot because I think whether you look at the disease as a tragedy and a disaster or whether you look at the vaccine protocols as a success and you know a march into the future, the issue is we do forget what happens to the patients who weren't vaccinated, what happens to the people who had the disease. Um, who are sufferers, who are debilitated. What happens to funding when we don't see the threat anymore? What happens to vac uh, vaccine protocols when people don't see the threat? Why should I get my kid vaccinated for measles? There are no measles. What happens when those things become invisible? What happens to collective memory is really important. And our belief at the museum is that the way history can help us today is by opening up these stories and making them present to us again, by reminding us just how much the community matters 
and how much connecting people, connecting us to each other. And that means universities and lay people, and it means high schools, and it means the general public. It means everybody getting together and having a conversation, talking about these issues in a really meaningful way. That's how we prepare for epidemics. That's how we prepare to face new challenges. So today, we're seeing new challenges. We have the history of old challenges to look to to decide what the next steps really should be. So that's the conclusion of our historical presentation. What I'd like to do now is bring up and introduce our mini panel. So let's give them a hand as we bring up the chairs. I'm going to turn you guys around. Did you see the high-tech way we did that? <laughs> you can probably take the reserve signs out there. I think so. Yeah. I'm actually going to let you guys introduce yourselves, because I, that was part of my first question, because I'm cheating. But what I wanted to do was give you the history and then allow you to hear a little bit about what it's like today. So Henry and Drew, thank you for joining us. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourselves? Sure. Um, so I'm uh, uh, an, an infectious disease physician and an immunologist. I uh, work at, at Case and um, at university hospitals. And um, my, my, my research focus uh, is really, or my main interest, is, is, is the immune system and its relationship to infectious pathogens. And in specifically, there's two ways to look at that. One, obviously, the easy one is to think about how the immune system can protect us. And it does. On the other hand, it sometimes overreacts and actually contributes to making things worse. And so finding that balance is, is a challenge. And um, we've made amazing progress in understanding the immune system and trying to apply that um, to modern infectious diseases is, is our, big, our big challenge. Um, there are a lot of vaccines that we use that, were, that work perfectly fine without a lot of fancy uh, immunology because they were simply done empirically by taking a piece of a bug and putting it in just a little bit more sophisticated than Dr. Jenner, but n not really all that uh, much more sophisticated. And, and they work. But there are a lot of diseases for which the vaccines are more complicated. Um, and, and that's where the challenges lie. Um, the infectious disease that I focus on is actually a very old one, tuberculosis, which you know some people think shouldn't that have been eradicated a long time ago. And, and in some ways, it should have, but it hasn't. Um, and it's emerged, actually, uh, in many parts of the world, not so much in the United States. but. Um, in many parts of the world, it's, it's still a huge problem, in part because of uh, drug resistance, in part because of HIV, and in part of, uh, because of urban crowding. I won't use the word filthy um, in this context, but the, um, the concentration of individuals in, in urban areas allows the transmission of this respiratory infection. Um, so we're trying to apply modern methods to look at, at, at tuberculosis. And that means in Cleveland, uh, we work in the lab, and we we work with mice and we work with cells, uh, but then if we want to study the disease, we also work overseas. So I spent a lot of time in Uganda, primarily with the case Westerns had a long-standing collaboration in Uganda um, around tuberculosis uh, primarily, but other infectious diseases as well. And it's there that we can actually study people with the disease and try to understand why does someone contract it, why does someone protect themselves, why do some people get ill uh, from it, um, and so forth. Um, and so that's sort of uh, my, my background. Great. Thank you. Drew? My name's Andrew Heffron. Um, I'm, my undergraduate degree was in nursing, and now I'm a master's in public administration student at Cleveland State. And I enjoy that. That's where we study the kind of the, the good, the bad, and the ugly of uh, government bureaucracy. Um, and I get to apply that, but I recently worked for the Cleveland Department of Public Health. Uh, and there I worked under an immunization grant to get immunization rates up in the city. What we try to shoot for is 90% immunization coverage among children, <clears throat> particularly under two, because they're the most likely to die from a vaccine-preventable disease. Um, and there's lots of challenges that go along with that. Often we find that low vaccine rates tend to match with poverty. And that's a lot of times because of resource issues. You know, maybe I talked to one provider, they said over half their patients don't have a car. So when there's two feet of snow, you're probably not going to make it to your immunization appointment. Mm -hmm. um, and then recently, I've, been, I've went over to, there's the Cleveland Department of Public Health, 
Now I'm at the Cuyahoga County Board of Health. We work as a team in many aspects, and now I'm a supervisor over the immunization clinic, which is a very high volume. We have a travel clinic. We see children, uh, adults trying to get back to work. They need their immunizations to work at university hospitals. Uh, and then uh, beyond that, we also have a, a family planning clinic. So it's preventative service, right? Immunizations and family planning, so STD testing and treatment and uh, birth control. Thank you, thank you. Um, the first question I have, and this is, uh, we'll be passing out sheets that you guys can follow along on, but the first question I have is, are there obstacles to eradication today? Are there, what are the obstacles that you've seen to, say, fighting tuberculosis or to getting people, um, to getting that 90% 90, 90 vaccine rate? What kind of obstacles do you see and what, and what are you doing to try and get over those obstacles? So um, I think, well, TB is actually a very good uh, example of uh, the irony is that we've had very good drugs for t TB for a long time. They're actually generic and they're very cheap. Um, the diagnostics we have for TB are still are a little primitive, although they've recently gotten, gotten better. Uh, but in principle, the ability to diagnose and treat TB around the world has been available for a long time. But it's been, in that situation, very much failure of systems, systems of procurement of drugs, systems of, of getting people to, um, to the clinics and complete treatment. Um, TB is a chronic infection, so it's not something you can take a couple of uh, doses of penicillin. You need to take six months of antibiotics. But if you take six months of antibiotics and you have a sensitive organism, you should be cured. And yet, there's been failure around the world um, for that. So it has to do with resource allocation. It has to do with, with delivery systems. Um, all of things that I, as a researcher, know nothing about and can, can do very little about. But it certainly makes you aware of the limitations and why public health structures uh, are so important. So for example, in Cleveland, um, we have a TB clinic. It's at Metro. And the key people in that clinic are not the physicians, but it's the public health nurses, because they actually go out and uh, make sure that patients take their medicine and watch their Adam's apple go up and down as they swallow the pills, rather than try to cheek them and, or, or, or throw them out. Um, and, and they also go out and, and check the rest of the family members or the close contacts who may have acquired the infection and are not aware of it. So it's really an, a, a combination of, of, of science and then implementation um, for something uh, like TB. So, so what, what I do and what I've worked on under this grant, the immunization grant doing, is trying to get immunization rates up. And again, like I said, the big barrier with that is poverty. It almost links directly to low immunization rates. The other interest I have in the hot topic right now is immunization refu refusals. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Um, and that, that's a, a, a challenge. I mean, poverty is a challenge too, but the refusals is something that I'm, I'm definitely interested in. People doing research on change love to do immunizations because it's something that they can quantify and say, yes, you got it, or no, you didn't, and look at the rates. So you hear lots of research, not on people who are medical people, but people who are researching change. Um, and so, for example, I heard somebody on NPR who does change research at, at Harvard, and he. He was studying um, how do you get a parent to change their mind if they're refusing. And he said that it's, it's, a, it's a fight or flight response, right? We want what's right for our babies. Sometimes when I sit there and watch my babies get vaccinated, I'm like, ooh, this, this is kind of unnatural, right? Or that's actually me when I get my Tdap. I'm like, yeah, right? Um, and so how, their answer was that you need, to, you need to address their ego. And if you confront them and say what you're doing is wrong, they're going to go on the defense. So maybe some empathy, like I understand you care most about your child. Probably a better approach, right, rather than a confrontation. And that you're trying to do what's best to the, protect your child. And then we've gone all other kinds of things to, to get to the bottom of why they're refusing. Sometimes your statistical mind, when it gets into the millions, can't really comprehend some of these percents. So, some people say, why don't we do more research on the side effects of vaccines? Well, when one in two million people are having side effects, what kind of research study? How many people would have to be in the population, right? You need a field of like 200 million. It's going to be an expensive study, pretty much impossible. Um, and so th those challenges can be very ch interesting. And so one of the things I like looking at is who's refusing the populations. Mm -hmm. And this is what we see at clinics. 
the number one, I call them the granola parents. Okay, that's your that's your overeducated master levels, um, reads a lot, too much time on the internet. Um, uh, you know, and guess what states have the most granola parents who refuse vaccines? California, Washington, Washington, Washington Oregon, yes. Yeah. Um, Portland, Oregon. Portland, Oregon, yes. It's a hotbed of this. It's, in fact, it's dangerous to go there because yeah. you're going to catch every <laughs> infectious <laughs> disease. <laughs> Hey, not a vacation spot, is yeah. what we're saying. Go to West Africa any time. I wouldn't go to Portland. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, so, and then number two is your religious exemptions. And then number three, which is a small pocket, but I've had some interesting case studies with this, is um, how do I say this del delicately? Where there's, there's uh, uh, usually a, a male figure in the home who's trying to uh, have power, and that there's some refusals going on to keep things in his house the way he wants them. That's rare. I've seen it. it. It's unfortunate. There can be some sad stories like where, not to get too complicated, but after you have, if, you, if the mother has hepatitis and she's going to have a baby, you can give that baby some medications when it's born, like the hepatitis B vaccine, and decrease the baby's chance of having hepatitis. Mm -hmm. And there was a case where a dad didn't want the baby to get hepatitis. Children's Services tried to stand, uh, step in, and it was a complicated issue. Um, and that was one of those issues, like at what percent of risk is the government allowed to step in and say you have to do this? Mm -hmm. and, and those are some interesting conversations, I think. That's fascinating. Actually, the, um, so you, you both actually addressed my, my next question, so we'll skip that one, which was how, how are vaccines involved? So in order to, I, I want to make sure we have plenty of time for the roundtables, I'll go to my third question, which is we're seeing a lot about epidemics in the news right now from flu to Ebola. And my question is, um, how prepared are we to face an epidemic in, in this country or in Cleveland specifically? How, how, do you, how well are we prepared? Um, well, I think, I mean, and I think that that's where the public health systems and in, in our country, the Centers for Disease Control has a key, has a key um, function. They have sentinel clinics around the country where they try to monitor, for example, for flu, um, where they can do the early detection and determine not only that flu is here, but also which strains are circulating and whether or not the vaccine that is produced is actually um, adequate. Um, and you know, I'm a scientist, so I believe the technology is key and the ability these days to rapidly identify microorganisms, even new ones, is remarkable. Um, the PCR, which is a way of detecting genetic material that is associated with microorganisms, is incredibly powerful. And it's very easy to rapidly identify uh, new or, or, or existing organisms or change in organisms. Um, but it requires an infrastructure of laboratory testing and access to samples and, and very aware clinicians or public health officials that are noticing a change in a pattern. You know, if there's a sudden cluster of, of of activity, um, and so um, I think we're, you know, the, the the ability of getting the information is there. But I think that sometimes, and you can speak to this more than I can, that there's always it's easy to cut down on the public health on funding the public health labs because they don't really do the things that are prevention is very unspectacular, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. and and uh, yet you need this infrastructure and you need it at the state, at the local, and at the national level. And you know, I, I, that's definitely true in the history that I've already presented, is that as long as you can see the disease, it terrifies people, that is the spectacular element. The, the disease outbreak is the spectacular element. The prevention becomes invisible, and then it's harder to sell in some ways. Yeah. I, I had the privilege of manning or staffing the emergency operations center during the Ebola, I don't know if I would call it crisis or outbreak, but when the person... Panic. Panic, cause that's a good <laughs> word go. for it. When the nurse landed in Cleveland, you know, the, you want to see a, a people, group of people drop their head. It's like when we saw that plane land and that re media report go out, we just saw when, oh, this is going to be a late night. Text your wife, <laughs> tell her, you know, we were there till midnight that night and then the shifts all night started. Because what it, it threw into plan everything that we trained for. And there's, you can't, I mean, it's in the billions of billions of billions of dollars that go into preparing for these situations. And we were there, everyone's well trained, and then the uh, mayor's assistant came in and asked, how many patients, if they had Ebola, could we manage where we could track their contacts, mm -hmm. create, uh, have places in hospitals where they could be isolated to just them, um, and have the 
properly trained staff to take care of them. Like how many could we, could we do before the, the cup started to overflow? And I don't specifically remember the number, but the number was low and it was concerning, right? <laughs> that being said, I think that these efforts need to be made and a lot of good came out of that Ebola. It's kind of like when H1N1 hit. H1N1, yes, it was a dangerous strain, and, but what came out of it as far as emergency prepare, preparedness <clears throat> was really good. And what came out of Ebola was like hospitals talking to each other. Like, at one point there was, well, where are all the sick patients going to go and all, where are all the non-infected going to go? So let's say you're a, a patient at Metro and you're there for liver failure. Do you want to be in the same hospital where they're bringing all the, all the Ebola patients? And so what happened there is everyone got at a table, which is not all too common maybe, <laughs> and, and decided, well, this hospital is going to be the, where all the sick patients will go, the Ebola patients, and this is where we'll transfer the other medically ill to keep them away from the Ebola patients. So that's a good thing, right, mm -hmm. that we're collaborating. That's great. Yeah. So I, really what I hear coming out of both of what you're saying, and you're coming at it from two different sides, and again, my appreciation for you being here, is that that community aspect is still really important, that you have to have both the doctors and the public health. And then I think also media. Um, my last question before we break into small groups is, um, do you see, has social media changed the game? Has the ability to get the word out changed things for epidemics and preparedness? So I just recently gave up my flip phone, so I'm really not the right person to answer that question. <laughs> so I'll let you deal with that one. I do email. I love Snapchat and Periscope is an amazing thing. I don't even know how you uh, spell it. <laughs> but I, I think it absolutely has. So the night of Ebola, all day we're trying to get information out of CDC. We all have this perception that CDC is just these thousands and thousands of people working every day. It's, it's a five billion, their, their budget's 11 billion. Half of that is the vaccines that the uninsured get, okay? So it's not a huge budget as far as federal government goes. And so we were trying to get information from them all day. They didn't really have a lot of protocol set up. So we were like, should, should the people that were working on the plane be quarantined that she flew over on? And we weren't getting great answers. And I got home and I, it was a, it must have been around a holiday because we had a family dinner and my brother's telling me that they, they shouldn't have quarantined the, the woman in Maine, okay? And I had been told all day that they should, okay? So I'm getting in an argument with him and he's like, well, I, I go, where'd you get your information? I was at the EOC all day. And he goes, I heard it on CNN. So he had more up-to-date information than I had. <laughs> so then I had to prove it. I had to admit he was right, which was so painful. <laughs> <laughs> And so, yeah, I mean, I think in that aspect, social media, the media, that they can get stuff out way quicker yeah. than what mm -hmm. a health department can, um, unless we're using those as our tools. One thing I think we did really well with Ebola, we were on top with the media, because you either come on top sometimes with the media, or they'll, they'll create the story. So we, yeah. we wanted to cr drive the storyline of Whoa. calming panic, you know, in, in bringing a message that was our message. Mm -hmm. And we did a great job of that. All right, thank you. Thank you very much for our mini panel. Okay, thank you, thank you guys. What we're going to do now is I'm going to separate you guys into small, cozy groups. And you're going to get to answer some of these questions yourselves. We'll then come back to a larger group and we'll address those questions. We're going to go through these. I recognize that you probably went off in a lot of different directions, and that's fine. Share with us. These were really meant to be guiding questions. Not, uh, you don't have to follow them exactly. So we'd like to open this up to public discussion for the last 15 minutes, and I would love to hear from you. We are interested. What did you talk about? What were your conversations? Let's, uh, let's kind of start with the first idea about how the media or other things. So what would you like to start with? Someone share with me. The first question about epi epidemics and the media attention, um, what we talked about was that there is much misinformation mm -hmm. on social networks, but then there is also great information and uh, influencing uh, the population with proper information. So if somebody comes up with a, a not true situation. <laughs> and one of the things we talked about was autism mm -hmm. and vaccinations and the coincidence of, of, ch of children 
um, showing symptoms of autism at the same time that they get these vaccinations. And so there are people that are passionate about that side of the argument. And then there's also the other side of the argument that, that disproves that the physician who put this uh, statistics together was shown to be a fraudulent report. And then there are also um, additional uh, situations where people have uh, other experiences which support mm -hmm. the fact that you should have your uh, vaccinations. Um, and that's all on the first question. <laughs> that's great. Other thoughts about that? Because I think that's a really important um, discussion. Who, anyone else want to comment on that one? Like, I'm not touching that? <laughs> yeah, Sorry? Yes, we also talked about the some of the physicians that have said, you have three months to get your children vaccinated or we will no longer, you'll no longer come here because they're worried about the mm. herd immunity, their younger patients who can't get vaccinated and also the patients that have, that are immune and immunity, immune compromised. Mm -hmm. Thank mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right. Other, other things you wanted to talk about concerning, I, I know the, obviously the vaccine and autism thing has come up a lot in the media on both sides and some people are very loud about it. Um, other, other things you'd like to say? Yeah. One other question that I had even when the doctor and the gentleman from the county were speaking, last year the media said that the flu shots did not address the actual flu that people got. Mm. So why should I get a flu vaccination mm. if they can't even predict, they can't predict which flu will be affected by. Mm -hmm. So that's, you know, one of the other questions that we have. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm actually gonna run this over to you guys. To, to every, yeah, that's why I brought you, you didn't know that. <laughs> Did you, any, any ideas, any uh, thoughts about that? Yeah. Go ahead. Please go ahead, you go first, please. All right, uh, I think, you know, the, the, um, uh, the, the, the question of the efficacy of flu vaccines is really a, a tricky one and, and um, depends on the ability to predict the strains that are going to be around. And it doesn't mean it's completely ineffective, it just may not be as effective as you would like it. And I think that's important to, um, mm -hmm. uh, to distinguish. Um, it's also true that you will still get a boosted response which may protect you in the future against the virus that would be related. Um, so I think to say, uh, make a blanket statement that it's ineffective is incorrect. Mm -hmm. It's just not as effective as we would like it to be. Um, it takes a while to produce these vaccines and um, so they have to, they go by northern hemisphere and southern hemisphere mm -hmm. and so they figure out what's going on in the southern hemisphere for the strains that might be circulating in the north and vice versa and then they have to make a guess. Mm -hmm. um, and I wouldn't want to be the one who has to make that guess every year. <laughs> yeah. Uh, a friend of mine does uh, PhD research on um, risk assessment on whether or not you insure your crops, okay? <laughs> not the most exciting research, but I try to listen to them at dinner parties. But I think the flu vaccine is very similar. It's interesting how people perceive mm -hmm. risk. And yes, it's very complicated to pre predict the flu strains. And they basically, I always give the analogy, they go after the four biggest bullies in the neighborhood and they try to knock those out. There's going to be a fifth bully, a sixth bully, and an eighth bully. But you hope that bully is not as strong as the other four. You'd much rather have the fifth smallest bully punching you in the stomach, right? <laughs> and on top of that, if you get it, you're probably not going to get as sick, even if they don't get the right strain in there. And so to say to people, yeah, they miss the strains, but it's still a good idea, is sometimes a hard message to put out mm -hmm. there. Um, and it's something we have a huge battle with. There's a real urban challenge about the flu vaccine, that it makes you sick. Right? It's an mm -hmm. inactivated virus. It can't make you sick. Um, it, that it, it doesn't work. You know, the evidence does say it works. And so to get that, that message out is one of our challenges for mm -hmm. sure. And, you know, I think coincidence is a really interesting one too because um, when do we get the flu shot? Usually, like if I'm going to go get the flu shot, it's the same week that the weather's just changed and schools just start, I'm going to get the flu. Like, you know, I probably already got it when I go get the shot. Um, so you get sick because of that. And so the same thing, why, do, um, why is there coincidence of autism symptoms at vaccine times is because some of those things show up around the same time. And so it is a really interesting one because depending on how the media um, takes off with it or how, uh, how did you put it, misinformation, that there's information and misinformation and figuring out weeding out which is which is really, really difficult. So um, other thoughts on that or, or just questions that you have, things that came up in your group, let's, uh, let's hear more about what you have to say. 
Well, oh, one more. All right. Okay. <laughs> I'm speaking on behalf of our group, by the way. <laughs> our very terrific group here. So another obstacle is people's belief sometimes that it's the pharmaceutical companies that are making profit. You know, mm -hmm. you say that they have to do a lot of research and they're doing a lot of work. They're making a lot of money. So every CVS and every Walgreens and the Cleveland Clinic, University Hospital, everybody's pushing, go get that flu shot. So is it about do we really need the flu shot or is it the, the, the marketing mm -hmm. and promotion of these um, vaccinations. Mm -hmm. All right. Anyone else want to take a stab at that before I like go pick on our experts? Okay. <laughs> um, our group discussed um, the influence of the media so and the decisions that the media makes on which stories to cover and which epidemics to cover or which disease outbreaks and the vaccines that go along with those seem to be proportional. And it's all about the views from the media is what our group concluded. Um, whichever is going to get the most views is going to be the one that's covered. And oftentimes that isn't the best choice or the one that's most educational for the public. And that results in less vaccinations or in um, less prevention for that disease when it's not in the public eye. So that's our conclusion. All right, all right, thank you. Good, good, anyone else? All right, we're gonna run back there. Um, so we were talking about different obstacles, and I informed my group that I'm actually from Portland, Oregon. I did survive, so I am, and I am vaccinated. Um, fun fact. Um, but I, so growing up in Portland, like I didn't understand. There were a lot of my friends who actually are not vaccinated, and that was just a cultural thing. So an obstacle is just culture. Um, it was normal to have friends who like your parents just kind of signed a waiver and they didn't have to get vaccinated. Um, but a lot of the reasons behind that was it's more of a natural pathy type of idea is they didn't want to have these drugs that had, or these vaccinations that had a lot of chemicals and different things that were unknown and the true harm on the body and the side effects. Um, they were uncomfortable with those because mm -hmm. of, you don't know how aggressive these vaccina vaccinations can be. And specifically with children, like such a small body, like how they can respond to that. Okay, I promised I would get back to the experts here. The problem is that if you give it to a million people, some people will have uh, a side effect, some of which may be lethal. And um, for that reason, the pharmaceutical industry stopped making vaccines. It wasn't until Congress passed specific legislation to indemnify um, vaccine uh, developers from that risk uh, that basically would guarantee care of individuals who would have had a negative effect that, that uh, vaccine development really uh, restarted. Um, so I think, I think it's, it's not a big money maker for uh, drug companies. So I think to think of an economic incentive is, is probably not the right way to go. And I'm glad you survived Portland. Uh, <laughs> so doctor, who does make the pharmacy, who does make the vaccines? Oh, the pharmaceutical industry does, it's massive production. They, make. they make a little profit, but that's not, it's not their big, big money maker. I mean, it, they're companies. They're not in the charity business. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've read stats. I've, I've heard things that say that 2 to 5% of, of, of pharmaceutical profits is from vaccine. Don't quote me on the number, but it is a low number. Um, that being said, sometimes when I'm proposed by reps from the pharmaceutical companies, sometimes you do, you, you take it with a grain of salt. You know, like sometimes what, behind closed doors, us nurses are like, do you really need three doses of that vaccine? Can't we close the door with two and like make it simpler on us? But you know, there, there's a lot of research that goes on on that. And you, you hope a lot of it, and of course there's some, a lot, mo, uh, most of it is like independent research. It kind of concerns you when it's, it's just from the drug company doing, the, mm -hmm. doing the research. And it's hard not to be skeptical, um, you know, at the end of the day, I think you need to keep your, mission, your eye on the prize of preventing vaccine preventable diseases. And one website I, I proposed in my group that really I think is powerful, it's called shotbyshot.org. And they videotape, it's the California Department of Health, they videotape families either who've gone through a vaccine preventable disease or have lost a lo loved one. And you know, I don't like to show it to patients because I think it's kind of taken like a, it's a pretty, underhanded, heart-wrenching way to get them to change their minds. It, it, I'll feel it out if they seem open to it, but these stories are very powerful. You know, when you, when you see a, a mother who lost a, a, a son to, 
pertussis at three months. That, that's a very powerful story. And you know, I, I was lucky to work in orthopedic world where I saw a lot of post-polio patients making leg braces for them. I've done about every job you can imagine. <laughs> um, and uh, it was interesting here, because like, the patients that had a club foot from post-polio, they were very lucky that that's what they made it out of. You know, they, didn't, they saw all their friends lose their lives. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, you, you, you got how lucky we are to have these vaccines. Mm -hmm. I think sometimes we forget. And it, but I'm with you. Sometimes I'm like, come on, three doses, $120 <laughs> to dose, help us out. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Uh, my daughter is a physician and she practices in uh, Portland, Oregon. <laughs> but, but anyway, uh, I was concerned about. Uh, uh, the the Guillain Barre wasn't that uh, supposed to be uh, uh, associated with uh, the the vaccinations? Yes, correct. Yes. Mm. Early flu. Okay. Uh, it turned out to be nothing unusual. Uh, this, the, the statistics were the same. It's just that they vaccinated millions and millions of more people for the flu, and the Guillain Barre uh, syndrome affected many of many more than you would see in the course of a year, but statistically the same, uh, given that many people in, uh, inoculated. Okay. I think it got particularly bad at a time during the swine flu epidemic where there was this vaccine given and then the, the, the flu never came, and so yeah. uh, the only attention was paid to the side effects from the vaccine. Mm -hmm. um, Back in uh, the early 1960s, I think it was, we started having some polio, uh, increased incidence of polio. And uh, so in many areas, we started having community programs to, to uh, have vaccines for uh, on a weekend uh, in various clinics scattered all around the, the counties and the small towns and so on. And. Uh, it, the, the press was very useful in getting people out to get vaccinated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the uh, oral Sabin Sundays, is that what that was? Yes, uh, oral yes. Sabin Sundays. And so there, I think that's, that's a good point. The media isn't all about misinformation. The media can be a really powerful tool as well. And I think that uh, that's a good thing to remember. Be, um, because I, in the interest of time, I'm interested to know, what did you come up with about what do you think the major obstacles still are today to people uh, trying to get vaccinated? I was interested to see what you might have had to say about that in your groups. Anybody want to give us their thoughts? Uh, yeah, I'm from the same group, but uh, we talked a lot about how, uh, what you touched on, the access to vaccinations being the primary concern for people getting uh, people, people getting vaccinated. And I think the kind of high profile thing is that people are refusing to get vaccinations, but it's probably less of a concern than just simply access to them in general. Mm -hmm. And I think the most heartbreaking thing would be people who are who like, poor people who wouldn't have access, who are getting access but are refusing. I think that that's really it's really heartbreaking. Also, I had another question about um, like the TB and the West Africa kind of thing. I'm, I'm not really sure if TB is a problem in West Africa, but if it is, uh, do you think that all the attention from the Ebola ep epidemic and all the increased capacity from the Ebola epidemic, like, epidemic like PCR machines, would help in other diseases like like TB, or like in diagnosing or treating it? Um. <laughs> So, so I think that, that um, two things. So TB is a problem in you know all of Africa. I don't think the Ebola epidemic had any impact <laughs> per se there, but for something like malaria, it certainly did. And I think one of the uh, the the key interventions is that these uh, most of these viral illnesses present as fever, and fever can be any number of things. And having a machine that can rapidly determine is it Ebola, is it dengue, is it malaria. Mm -hmm. And PCR machines measuring the DNA of these different organisms is an extremely effective way of doing that. And one of the big problems they had in the West Africa epidemic was that anybody with a fever was assumed to have Ebola. Mm. And, and people stopped thinking about the fact that it could be malaria or something else. And so one of the first things they did was having some tests that could quickly determine was it or wasn't it Ebola or was it or was it not malaria so that people would get the appropriate treatment because obviously they're very different. Um, so when you do have epidemics, what does happen is blinders go on and people make mm -hmm. the assumption mm -hmm. that everything that you see is the epidemic. So f when there's flu season in this country, we all think everybody with fever's got the flu, but they also could have 
many other things. And if you don't think about it, you could be missing it and, and uh, misdiagnosing people. So yes, I'm a believer in testing. Hi. Um, I think another major barrier is just overall from a society standpoint, a lack of trust in what information we're getting mm -hmm. and what we could trust versus not. You touched on social media. And there's a lot of information out there. And it could become confusing for the general public on you know, myself included on like what is correct, what is valid, what has been proven versus what is being shown from a source that I've never heard of, is this right or wrong? And so I think that that trust barrier can cause people in society to sort of polarize and mm -hmm. feel a little bit more defensive about an issue that, you know, is it's healthcare, but it becomes a very mm -hmm. politically charged personal mm -hmm. debate. And I think that that's you know, societal-wide kind of an issue. Yeah, that's, that's great. And I, um, Julie, you... If I can add to that and then maybe also segue into question number three. And it's kind of really more of a question for the group than necessarily a comment. But in terms of a major obstacle, do you think that we may just be more confident in the uh, the progress of of healthcare um, today. I mean, we have just such tremendous technology. Mm -hmm. um, we have, you know, I, I think that. I mean, this may be pretty presumptuous, but you know, you know, from a vaccination standpoint, do you really need to get vaccinated when you have world class healthcare right down the street? Who's probably going to help solve it anyway. So, oh, which again, that brings down to mm -hmm. number three, if, you know, are we not really concerned about it because maybe we're just a little, you know, spoiled and overconfident because of the fact that we happen to be in an area where healthcare excellence is above mm -hmm. and beyond. And you know, and then there's just a wealth of technology and, and information to solve really any problem if you put your mind to it. So That's a great question because I think it gets back to the fact that do things become invisible, right? Do things become invisible? I think one of the reasons things may be becoming invisible is the gradual dumbing down of science programs in the United States where people begin to think that, oh, uh, uh, the Earth was created 6,000 years ago is a, uh, you know, you can draw that logically from, I don't know, some set of evidence that you have, and ignoring all the other, all the other stuff that comes about with science. And I think that's particularly, you, when you don't appreciate science, and you don't really have a grasp of epidemics and history, mm -hmm. all this becomes people just looking at their, their iPhones and, and conversing with one another on Twitter, then really thinking about the world that they're living in. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting. Other thoughts on that? I'm going to pass it over. I'm going to pass it over. I think that when you see these historical things, where people got the flu and they died, yeah. And for the young people who get have this HPV uh, vaccination, you know, until somebody gets cervical cancer or some kind of a cancer, then they don't know that they. Oh man, if it could have gotten that HPV mm -hmm. vaccine, mm -hmm. could have prevented that. Well, addressing your question, I think the fact that we are around so many world-class hospitals also aids to the number of uh, like the vaccinated people that we have here. Because if you, if you trust the hospitals to treat you when you're sick, if they tell you to get your vaccinations, there's no reason for you not to trust them. Mm -hmm. So I think that probably contributes to the high vaccination rate that we have in Cleveland because we have these great hospitals and we trust them. Mm -hmm. It's an interesting uh, point. I'm, I'm going to slowly sort of wrap this up here. Um, it's an interesting point, too, I think, because it gets back to the heart of all of these issues, which is um, education and finding routes to good information is really the way forward, whether that's education in schools or educational programs like something like this, or the fact that we are, um, you know, tr you're right. Can we be overconfident? Overconfidence can lead to a lot of problems. At the same time, um, our access issues, I think, are really important. And it's not just access to the actual vaccines, but access to the information about them as well. Well, what we talked about is it's out of sight, out of mind. Mm -hmm. And basically, where are all these diseases? NIMBY, not in my backyard. Mm -hmm. And it basically, uh, when you think of, uh, well, Chipotle and the uh, problems they had, that's in the supply chain. Or think about MRSA. What do you do to eliminate that? You know, that super bug. 
pandemic is out there somewhere. Mm -hmm. We just have to hope that we're prepared when it uh, finally comes. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Um, actually, we're going to end kind of on that note because I think that that gets us back to that early question I asked at the very beginning, which is blame versus information. You know, it's not about what's happening out there to those other people. It's about what we're going to do here to make sure things don't happen in the future. It's conversations like this that really matter. It's people talking to each other that really matter. I want to first thank all of you for being here because this kind of community is what the Dittrich Museum is all about. It's what the Baker Nord Center of the Humanities is all about. And I'm going to make an invitation, a couple of invitations. One. We have uh, on the table back there some lovely calendars from the Baker Nord Center. It also has their events. Uh, a lot of them are really great. Many of them are free. Uh, actually, I think maybe all of them are. Where's Maggie? They're all free. They're all free. They're free. It's all free. Um, also, the rest of the conversations events, um, this is number three. There are three more. There's also events that I'm hosting at the Global Center for Health Innovation, which are similar. Uh, the next one's February 9th, and it's on cardiac. It's called the Cardiac Kids, not the Cleveland Browns. <laughs> not the Cleveland Browns but like them, except with hearts. So not football, same, same basic shape. Um, so I'd like you to pick up cards. And also, please, come join us back at, do you want to put these over on the table? Yeah. Uh, join us at the, uh, the District Museum down the street. Again, we're open till 7 o'clock on Wednesday nights. We're open 9 to 4.30 the rest of the week. We welcome you to be part of our community. If you're not a member already, it's relatively inexpensive. And we're interested in making you part of the family that we have over there. Thank you so much for coming. You are the success of these programs. Thank you. Thank you.